so much to all of you for coming tonight. And, you know, you've given me such a wonderful warm welcome. It's almost made uh, being banned for so many years uh, worthwhile. Um, I want to thank the Sheraton Hotel as well for hosting this event. And it was so exciting to come to this iconic place, the epicenter of the election, in order to, uh, to, to launch this book. And also, of course, I want to thank uh, the team from Malaysia Keeney, um, led by Prem and Stephen. Um, and of course, uh, the publishers uh, from Jarrett Madaya, um, Pak Chon and Charles Brophy, for taking a punt on the book. And let's hope it was worth it. <laughs> but uh, almost as much as anything, my wonderful team of volunteers. Um, I'm so grateful to all of you. You've done so much, not just on the book, but, uh, you know, we've worked together and you've been at my, my back all this time. Um, Sam, Cece, Yolanda, Pip, Beatrice, Karen, Amy, Robin, Hilary, Linda, and so many others. Um, and Tony, thank you for your very kind words, always laced with a little barb. <laughs> um, you have been an absolute key ally, or should I say, co-conspirator co or collaborator <laughs> over these last two years. Um, if, if I broke the story, it was uh, Tony who rammed it home um, and who issued those relentless press releases um, that uh, kept Najib and BN on the run. Um, he didn't let them hide. We got those facts out. And um, you know, with his forensic uh, financial brain, I was always very grateful to be able to bring back uh, you know, all these documents that I was turning up. And I'd say, come on, Tony, what does this mean? And uh, you know, he'd sort of kind of work it out and, where, where the money might have come from and where it might have gone. So, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know what we'd have done without you, Tony. You're a hero of Malaysia, you really are. Um, um, but you know, in fact, this is a project that has involved so many people um, to whom I'm indebted, some of whom have supported me completely anonymously, people who joined in and sometimes risked a great deal to expose wrongdoing all for the same reason, because they thought it was the right thing to do. I experienced an astonishing upsurge of that sort of dedicated support that would have cost a fortune in salaries if anyone had set about commissioning so many bright and professional people. They became a veritable army to draw on. People would email, for example, as Tony said, hi, you know, I've been looking through the published figures or reports for this company or that. And there's a total conflict with what one MDB and the Prime Minister are saying. Really? I would say. Oh, I'd take a look. And uh, yes, they'd be right. And I'd write a story. Um, critics would condemn what they described as the Rue Castle Brown publishing empire. It was a backhanded compliment that we used to laugh at. But to an extent, that's what we became. A ragtag, guerrilla outfit that took on a multi-million dollar communications operation and gave as good as we got. Truth is immensely powerful, and hope can move mountains, and we proved just that. Certainly it was that friendship from so many Malaysians and other well-wishers from across the world, which more than anything has kept me going through some pretty hostile times writing the Sarawak report. Together it made us a force to reckon with, not thanks to money or resources, but to a determination to counter corruption and stand up for the rule of law. So let me say this, if cash is king, checkmate. The same determination is what changed Malaysia on May the 9th. So again, I thank all of you, and let's celebrate what's been achieved together. So what of this book I've written, the story behind the blog? Well, it's really just my perspective on the events that consumed us all to a greater or lesser degree as one MDB scandal unfolded with all the momentous consequences that brought. Others will have seen things differently, and I hope you will forgive me for the omissions or misinterpretations or any offence I might unwittingly have caused, some of them perhaps less unwittingly. There will be much better histories of this whole affair, but my account represents how it feels to be a journalist who suddenly realises they've identified what promises to be a huge story and then goes about uncovering it. And then what it feels like to reap the 
consequences of simply infuriating a hornet's nest of rich, powerful, and sometimes downright dangerous people. In short, it's been hugely exciting. People have said this about the 1MDB saga, but it's been like following a movie. And for me, it's been like living in a movie much of the time, full of twists and turns, and indeed, no shortages of alarming moments. No one should go into journalism to get rich or for a safe, secure op occupation. But in terms of sheer adventure, job satisfaction, and hoping to make a difference, it's a great life choice if you can get the freedom to do the job properly. And I hope that with the change that has happened, that will be an option for many more young Malaysians in the future. Because I passionately believe that they will play a vital role in keeping safe your hard-won, renewed democracy. When I first presented my draft of this riveting saga, um, the agents and publishers in the UK responded rather in the way that Tony did. They didn't read it, they weighed it. <laughs> and obviously, they said it was too long. Surely you can boil down this David and Goliath number into 180 pages to make for a quick read that people can pick up at the airport. Well, no, I said, because so much happened. You know, you cannot believe the places this story went. It started in the long houses of Sarawak and then reached into Hollywood, Vegas, the finance houses of the globe, treasure islands, mega yachts, Capitol Hills, Beijing, road bankers, lawyers, fake news providers. We exposed them all. This story of 1MDB encapsulates so much of what's happening in the world today, and it isn't being sufficiently said, told, or I think understood how a mega-powerful political and financial global elite increasingly feel that they can exploit the vulnerable with an impunity. And I will come to a halt breathlessly. Well, the publisher said, you can at least leave out most of the stuff about the political side of Malaysia and the issues to do with the rainforest and, and so many characters we don't know about yet. To which I replied, if you had lived through all this drama, like people in Malaysia have, then I'm sure you'd want to hear about those details. So, like my blog in the first place, I rejected their London-centric views, and I've written this book primarily with Malaysians in mind. So I risked the jibe that you might find it hard to pick up as a result, but I also very much hope that you'll find it hard to put down. However, I suspect that many of you in the room are here today, um, and I'm very flattered to see some prominent faces. Um, you could primarily be here to check as soon as possible whether you feature in my account of this national story and all its glory. And if so, what I might have said about you. Unfortunately, the tag whistleblower sticks. In fact, I know that a lot of my pre-sales have come from people anxious to do just that. In some cases, we thought that it would uh, probably be wiser to just send their money back, if only to hold off their threatening lawyers until the deed was safely done. But if you're here for a quick flick through, with such things in mind, I have a bit of bad news. Since for a number of reasons, there is no index in this print run. So I'm afraid people will have to buy the book and read it all the way through just to find out what I'm saying about who and what. And remember, if you're hiring liable lawyers to do it for you, those fellows read notoriously slowly and charge a fortune per minute. In fact, a cheaper option would be doubtless to buy up all the copies of the book instead. I can see you behind the room. Such minor concerns, however, have not, as you may have gathered, prevented some of the characters, who have quite rightly guessed that they might make a star appearance in my little narrative, from hiring the most expensive libel firms in the UK to warn my publishers to stop distributing it or face serious damages. They claim concern that I may have defamed them in some way. One wonders why. Except the same lawyers are simultaneously warning that these very clients, who are responsible for no wrongdoing whatsoever, also fear they may shortly be facing charges of some kind relating to 1MDB, in which case to publish information about them would allegedly prejudice their right to a fair trial, resulting in further serious damages, of course. So it seems that's what stolen money can buy for you these days. You can not only threaten damages on the grounds that you are entirely innocent, but you can also, in case you turn out to be 
not so innocent after all. You may have seen in the international press recent reports that the FBI are, are at this very moment investigating the links between 1MDB's missing money and certain payments to the very same law firms and PR outfits who are making these sorts of threats and arguments. Who could have missed Joe Lowe's Australian PR company's pronouncements last week, informing that Joe Lowe would not submit to a jurisdiction which he described as advancing a corrupt political agenda without any form of legal process. It's an infuriating thought, isn't it? Malaysia's stolen public money funding these sorts of insults against the new democratically elected government made by a gang of people who don't even dare show their faces. And it's not just a matter of insults, but continuing injury to the rights of Malaysians who want to know what's going on and to see justice done. My UK publisher pulled out over the prospect of the experience of fighting over such crazy issues, as indeed did one of the world's largest publishers, Hachette, who have also now declined to publish the Wall Street Journal's billion dollar whale book in the UK. And that's owing to the relentless exploitation by the super rich of Britain's absurdly outdated libel laws, which go back to the days of duelling in advance. And we really need to get back and sort those out. But the good news is, here in KL, you still have your chance to lay your hands on these endangered volumes, for now at least, because as you can see, I'm publishing anyway. Since I believe that the truth and public interest come first, and I think you do too. A small Malaysian publisher is also sticking with me and distributing the book on the same principle. Let's see how long we hold out. No lawyer has yet had the cheek to come to Malaysia and argue that people shouldn't be publishing books about 1MDB, but maybe they will. Maybe they'll secure some sort of injunction. You never know these days. So my advice is to rush out there and quickly buy the book while you're still able. <laughs> More seriously, I'm standing up for publishing this book because I'm fairly certain that if I had not kept going together with other media who bravely stuck their necks out in the face of massive pushback, then we would not have nailed the issue of 1MDB, and we might very well not have achieved the outcome of the last election. Malaysia would continue to be paying a higher and higher price for all the corruption and cover-up which was spiralling out of control under the previous administration. Now instead, Malaysia has a government that has prioritized a full and proper investigation into this record global scandal involving billions of dollars of stolen public money. A scandal that was being denied through a deluge of lies and was fast turning into a source of oppression and tyranny in this country. That's why we need to stick up for a free media and for freedom of expression against politicians and others who claim both need to be controlled. Let's remember the duty of journalists is to get information about what's going on, especially in the corridors of power, over to those who are ultimately in charge and have to make the final key decisions, by which I mean the public. And that's what I've been trying to do with 1MDB, and many other brave Malaysian media organisations have also struggled to achieve over the past couple of years. Malaysia Kini, The Edge, Free Malaysia Today, Malaysian Insight, and others who fronted up a naked aggression from the powers that be. In the absence of a free press, these mainly online operations function primarily as Malaysia's equivalent of the, war, of the Washington Post during the Watergate affair, and you should be proud of them. Now, now they're being joined by a liberated mainstream media also, and it's all for the good. One of the most encouraging things I've heard over the past few months was your new Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir, himself recognising the vital role of a free media and pledging to protect it in the future from the sort of arbitrary threats and interference that have cowed so many journalists for so many years in this country. Of course, journalists are far from perfect creatures, and I hope you get a flavour in my book of some of the little rivalries we can indulge in, and worse failings too, myself included. However, you can deal with a faulty or dishonest journalist far more easily than a dishonest government, especially 
if they're hiding what's going on. I do wonder, meanwhile, if Malaysia's successful outcome in this affair, the ejection of a government that had been held to account, could perhaps also play out as a healthy role model for other more powerful and prominent nations which may be experiencing a similar battle between the media and potential po and political potentates at this very moment. Let's show others the way. In late 2017, Malaysia was turning into a place of real fear. As powerful leaders sought to defend themselves from criticism through crackdowns, closures, and criminal charges in all directions. We'd entered a looking glass world governed by fake news laws, where facts were proclaimed to be falsehoods and vice versa. And then we voted it all away. Coming back after my ban for allegedly spreading false news, I have seen nothing but relief and delight. Everywhere is sunny again. And that's the best thing about this real story we've lived through, which is that while it felt like a nightmare at the time and we feared it could get even worse, all has ended well because people banded together and stood up against a dangerous undermining of the rule of law. That was in spite of the toxic rhetoric that everyone was getting used to from people in power who seemed hell-bent on stirring up differences and pitching people against each other to try and distract, it seems, from the discovery of corruption in high places. That's how they planned to stand, hang on to office. But the opposite happened, didn't it? Armed with facts and information brought by a news media which had shown it could be trusted, people united instead. Old political foes came together, a former perceived strongman joined with campaigners with whom he had once clashed, sometimes even jailed. And they all signed up to a program of reforms and a joint manifesto and pledged to release the country's most important political prisoner. And behind this unity of leadership, the majority of the nation moved in the same direction on election day to pitch out the perpetrators of this massive theft known as 1MDB. Amazingly few people at the time really believed they would be able to make that change. Banned from the country, I felt a rather lonely voice into the run-up of that election, urging that the tsunami could happen, because I could see that so many of you wanted it to happen. But what mattered in the end was that so many people decided that win or lose GE14, they personally were simply determined as a matter of conscience, as their duty to the future of their nation, at such a dangerous hour for their democracy, that they would do the right thing and make a stand. If that meant queuing in a car for hours and then standing in the sun at a polling station, or even, you know, flying in from across the world to place their vote, that's what millions of Malaysians did, and that's what created the tsunami. Few of them might have thought that they would succeed, but they refused to be the ones who gave up and didn't try. And it shows that if some people are prepared to stand up for what is right, then right can prevail, even in the face of what looked like hopeless odds with a powerful regime, determined to manipulate everything in their favour. It has been wonderful for Malaysia, which was facing tyranny at the start of 2018, to be able to show a positive way forward for so many others, achieving peaceful democratic change through the ballot box and setting off on the path of reform and the strengthening of the rule of law towards a more prosperous future. So how did all this begin? The adventure of 1MDB, through my eyes at least, which is the story of this book. I started this journey not through a story of grand corruption in high places, but at a deeply troubling situation and an injustice that I had identified at grassroots level in East Malaysia, where I was born and spent my early years. In the early 1960s, when my family were living and working there, virtually the entire island of Borneo was covered in pristine jungle, the oldest in the world. For me and the people who lived there, it was a paradise and natural wonder. There were more species here than anywhere on Earth, and most of them had yet to be discovered, and the scientific potential in terms of human knowledge, medicine, and future economic wealth was incalculable. However, there were people in positions of power who could calculate a very different kind of profit. Armed as they soon were with the new technology, caterpillar bulldozers and chainsaws. 
They could carve up the jungle into concessions, gaining advanced loans to destroy it based on the money that the timber could later fetch once sold on the international market. As we now know, this was carried out as a selfish business exercise in the guise of bringing progress to the local people. Instead, native rights to the land were railroaded, and most have been left with almost nothing. Many are still living without proper roads, water or electricity, in a wasted jungle that once had acted as their larder and a source of endless materials. Clear waterways that had once teemed with life now run red like blood, clogged up and polluted by the erosion of the soil and polluted by pesticides and fertilizers from palm plantations. The locals complain now that there's virtually no catch left from these dirty sources of water. So who was benefiting from this human and environmental tragedy? I wondered when back in 2006 I returned to Sarawak after so many decades and flew over thousands of square miles of dreary palm plantations where once I had remembered a glorious canopy of life. Everyone knew the answer to that, although it was said in whispers as people looked over their shoulders. All the money had gone to a handful of people in charge and to their cronies. The wanton and unnecessary destruction was d driven not by a desire for progress, but by corruption. A region that could have been sustainably managed and selectively planted and forested for the benefit of all had been clear felled to turn just a few families into some of the richest families on the planet. I resolved, therefore, to collect the evidence and at least report on the truth of what had happened on the line. I might not be able to stop it, I thought, but someone at least had to try. And because I'd learned very quickly that the people locally, including the media, felt disempowered, silenced by the oppression that comes with corruption and cover-ups, I decided that I had a role to play. Many of you are journalists, so I don't need to tell you about the insidious pressures levelled against the media until so recently, particularly in places like Sarawak, because it was you who explained the situation to me. If you wanted a licence to print or to keep your job, you could not criticise. Worse, step out of line, and there were all sorts of nasty laws that could put you in jail even and cause trouble for those close to you as well. It meant that all sorts of nastiness was barely being reported Intimidation of local people by gangsters if they stood up to the loggers, for example. Negligence by police in following up such cases. Sometimes we were talking about rape and murder, but above all, fear. Fear that if you stood up to the bullies, then something could happen to you, and nothing would be done about it. People asked me for help. Tribal people who I went to visit, professional people who I met in towns, activists who came to London. BN had slowly tightened its vice as people in power set about protecting their business interests. So that by 2010, when I took what was for me a momentous decision to start Sarawak Report, people back here in Malaysia felt that they could not speak out freely about such issues. They needed an outside voice. To me, it felt utterly daunting, but I realized since no one else in the media was talking up this cause, mainly because they couldn't, then I should try. As many of you know, I began by concentrating on those issues of timber corruption, aided and encouraged by supportive NGOs and sympathetic political and civil campaigners without whom I could never have made the impact I did. I was looking for the facts and the evidence to hold powerful people to account. Where had the money gone? Why was it not being invested in the people? How come there was so much wealth abroad? These were the questions I began answering, asking and investigating for answers and the response was almost immediate. Within weeks, I was getting thousands of hits on my website, and I was put on the Sarawak immigration backlist. And very soon after that, the backlash became more vicious. I found myself the target of anonymous blogging and open political attacks. Ministers queued up to denounce Sarawak Report and its sister outfit, Radio Free Sarawak, laced with dark threats about sedition for going against the government. And I would like to say that some of the brave heroes who dared join me to run that, that pirate station are actually here tonight. Peter, Carol, Amy, thank you. For much of the time, our little team had to work undercover 
and in exile abroad for their own safety, away from their families. But we know it was worth it as the callers started to pour in and speak out about their concerns. When one political attacker compared our little radio station to a toxic virus poisoning the minds of simple rural folk, we took it as a compliment. We reckoned that we were bringing people facts and giving them a voice. We were delighted if they were creating an epidemic of free expression and ideas. What better confirmation of our, our impact than the Chief Minister of Sarawak himself, after a particularly punishing state election in 2011, even stood up in the State Assembly and denounced me as an enemy of the state, accusing me of being part of a neo-colonialist plot to steal the country's oil. However, the more we got attacked in these ludicrous ways, the more we got noticed and the more our message struck home. I could get away with this because I was living, unlike other journalists, safely in a free media environment. But we could still get through to readers and listeners through the internet and through shortwave radio. It was why I felt that even as an outsider, I had a valid role to play and felt invited by so many people to do it. So despite the cyber attacks and jamming, we kept going by whatever means we could. Although, as you know, it got increasingly difficult as my investigations got closer to the pinnacles of power and central government. But by this stage, however, and I suppose we're talking about 2013, I'd become fully aware that the problem we were combating was not just about going what was going wrong in one little corner of the planet. It was not just the fault of a few corrupt local cronies. What was happening in Sarawak was part of a global problem, and the perpetrators were not just Malaysian by any means. After all, what's the point of cashing in a jungle if you can't get the money out and splash it around the world's hotspots and invest it in burgeoning real estate and business elsewhere? Ask Joe Lowe the same thing. When someone decided to raid one Malaysia's development fund, they made sure to get the money into dollars and as far away as possible from the scene of the crime, hiding it in Hollywood mansions, New York pads, yachts, jets, movies, works of art, all safely out of the country, or so they thought. And who was helping them do this? Who was lending them the money in the first place? Who was creating all the good PR and devising get-out plans and aggressive legal protection and political lobbying in the West? Well, that would be the huge army of willing foreign helpers, professionals operating freely within the loose confines of our global financial systems and legal frameworks. Most pernicious of all is the offshore system, a blatant tool devised by the privileged who don't want to pay their taxes or admit to wealth they can't explain, in order to get round the rules that the rest of us humble ordinary folk have to abide by. Pay a reasonable sum to a wisps to a Swiss wealth management advisor, hire a UK specialist lawyer, a tax consultant, an offshore incorporator, and you're on the road to safely setting up companies and bank accounts which no one can find out you own. It means that people like Claire Newcastle Brown, who rightfully suspect you're as rich as Cruces and the actual owner of a vast portfolio of possessions, um, which you could never have accrued legally, um, can't find out about it and can't get the proof to prove the, the information to prove it and, and reveal the embarrassing truth to the rest of the world. And as the saying goes, it shouldn't be allowed, should it? Seriously, why should all of us pay taxes and declare our ownerships and allow just a few of the wealthiest, including the least deserving criminals in the world, to get away with avoiding both, just to give employment to a bunch of laundering outfits? which is what I have discovered that so many international bankers, lawyers, accountants, business managers, tax consultants have been operating as. All these people together have been financing and leeching off this illegal exploitation of the most vulnerable, not just in Sarawak, but across the world, driven by so-called globalization, which has become a veritable gold rush, badly in need of better regulation before we destroy the planet. This is how... This is how my brother-in-law, the former British Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, put it in, an important, in his important introduction to my book, and 
I'm so delighted that we now have him taking a leadership in the course to reform this global problem. He says, what happened at 1MDB reflects the way modern globalization can work to aid rather than prevent wrongdoing, not only enabling money to be sent at speed, at the flick of a switch from place to place, and to any and all corners of the world, but also enriching secretive tax havens, operating questionable practices to hide assets and to disguise the real patterns of ownership and all too often to hide criminal acts. The money of the Malaysian people ended up in the British Virgin Islands and Seychelles, in Seychelles based companies with accounts in Singapore through a bank owned by the United Arab Emirates. Ironically, at a time when our ability to connect and communicate instantaneously should enable a thorough forensic accounting to track suspicious transactions and ensure there is no hiding place for them, things have got worse, not better. As long as national legal systems are limited in their ability to monitor and supervise extraterrestrial transactions, and as long as international cooperation remains ineffective and deficient, then sending money offshore will continue to deprive national treasuries of the revenues they need, leaving domestic populations worse off and in many cases impoverished. So it's a joint responsibility we're talking about. The corrupted politicians who act with impunity in their own countries on the one hand, and the willingness of major global institutions, generally in the West, but also based in Asia, to turn a blind eye in order to profit from the proceeds of that corruption. Global politicians need to take steps to address this pressing issue and not just to encourage a greater free for all. They need to heed these concerns that affect millions of people rather than just listen to those heavy fu heavily funded political lobbyists representing wealthy interests who are just another category of profiteer from all this misery. And on the subject of lobbyists and communicators, 1MDB has also served to open up and shed light on an important related global issue that has been troubling us all these days across the world, which is fake news. And by that I mean the industry of fake news, not what certain powerful people have chosen to call unwanted criticism. In the course of reporting on MDB and the issues of timber corruption, I found myself made a target, like so many other government critics in Malaysia, of a massive funded state-sponsored defamation campaign, primarily conducted once again by willing Western companies, so-called strategic communications providers, as the industry seems to like to call itself. I started finding myself the butt of this activity from around about 2011, and working to find out and expose what was going on, I discovered that companies like the now defunct FBC Media was being paid millions of dollars by both Tayyip Mahmood and Najib Raza in covert attempts to destroy the reputations of their enemies and puff up their own, primarily by using online blogs then positioning the material onto TV and into mainstream media. Another target of this vicious rumour mongering and defamation was the opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim, I discovered. These underhand, politically motivated attacks were all paid for, of course, out of Malaysia's public money. I exposed FBC, and it immediately closed down in 2011. But there were very many more. Next came Bell Pottinger, once the biggest PR company in the UK. But there it was, popping up, popping up, under the guise of a Sarawak-based blog called Sarawak Versa 2, which claimed to be written by young local activists seeking to protect the future of their state from economic ruin by foreign activists like myself. In fact, Sarawak Versatu was a defamatory lie from the beginning to end, all written up by these equally foreign Bell Pottinger PR folk sitting at their desks in London, once again being paid a fortune out of corrupt Malaysian money. Satisfyingly, they also have been caught out and closed down. And then Cambridge Analytica, the data manipulation outfit at the heart of the scandal involving Facebook. I discovered that its parent company, SCL, was also commissioned by BN in secret, to secretly promote them in key seats at the last GE14 election. When I reported that this scandal-driven com company was working in Malaysia, the BN government denied it. 
But then an SCL representative admitted it in an interview secretly recorded by UK's Channel 4 News. And I got a whole lot of documents detailing the contract. One of the shareholders of SCL is Lord Marland, a Conservative Party donor who has acted as one of Najib's key champions in the corridors of Whitehall. From where, I'm afraid, we heard too little, or far too little, in the way of criticism over 1MDB as the scandal unfolded. At least Cambridge Analytica are now also exposed and closed down. It goes to show that the best antidote to fake news is exposure by real reporters, but also that the Western media specialists, that Western media specialists have been just as willing to get in there with the profiteers from other professions to serve corrupt regimes across the world in perhaps the most deceitful and insidious way of all. And consider how that industry of misinformation using social media, which began testing its wares in places like Malaysia back around 2008, can now be identified as wrecking so much havoc in the centres of global democracy. We're all affected by these same patterns of corruption. I've been stalked, computer hacked by Western so-called private investigation companies as well. They all operate globally and are hired by people like Najib. So I hope that what has been revealed through this case study of 1MDB, which has provided what is still a rare glimpse into the inner workings of our corrupt offshore finance and associated enterprises, will help open decision makers' eyes and the eyes of ordinary folk to the very real dangers that, to our liberties that this presents. We're not all just collectively responsible for what went wrong down on the ground in Sri Lanka and in cases such as 1MDB. We are all collectively threatened by it. Think how Joe Lowe so nearly got away with it. Think how powerful a global businessman and political backer he might so easily have become with all that stolen money. That was the point that Andrew McCabe, then Deputy Director of FBI, made during those very first United States Department of Justice press conferences, revealing the de devastating findings on 1MDB. What he said was this, why does corruption halfway across the world matter so much to us here in the United States today? First, because some of those profits of those schemes were invested in the United States, and when corrupt officials bring their ill-gotten gains, they also bring with them their corrupt practices and disregard for the rule of law. And that fuels the growth of criminal enterprises and undermines the fair democratic process. Second, because stable, stable healthy democracies around the world, accountable to the rule of law, are the cornerstone of global security. So, not only are we all, as a global community, responsible for this corruption, we are all, as a global community, endangered by it. That was the point he made, and law, what law enforcers are belatedly working, waking up to, and why the United States set up its new kleptocracy unit that is, take, taking, that is taking on none other than 1MDB as one of its very first key enterprises. We all need them and the other regulators to keep up that fight, particularly because we're all affected. Remember, it's arguable that the biggest single driver of global warming is deforestation, particularly in the peak regions of the planet, which have acted as carbon sink for, for many countless millennia, and which we are now draining back into the air as we roll out those plantations. The fastest way we could help reverse the problem of global warming would be to grow some of that jungle back. This affects all of us, so why shouldn't the global community help invest in that? We need to recognize the problems and work together. So you'll be relieved to hear my time is almost up. And I, I'm aware I promised you juicy details from my book, and I've ended up lecturing you about all these other issues instead. But at least you've worked out the motive behind why I undertook what to many seem to be a crazy project to expose corruption in distant East Malaysia where I grew up. You may also have wondered what worked out why I latched on to the issue of corruption at the federal level. I realized simply that if corruption has become entrenched at the very top, there is no point trying to tackle it further down. One example, in 2012, well before I turned to 1MDB, I had, thanks to more help from that quiet army, 
of informants, and I think one of them may be here today, provided a full expose, including copious bank details, showing how tens of millions of dollars in timber kickbacks from Southern had gone into the Zurich bank accounts of certain prominent political figures. However, Najib Razak's BN government took zero action. We know why. It was a matter of safe deposits, both in the political sense and in the financial sense as well. So when I got the opportunity to dig into a scandal that exposed the problem of corruption right at the heart of Malaysian central government, I went for it. And I will have to admit, as a journalist as much as anything, I was driven by the excitement of such a huge story, which I by then knew could take on a global significance because of all that I have mentioned. But I'll have to leave those details, I think, until later. Um, I think I'll be taking questions, and um, perhaps that's the opportunity for me to talk to you about some of the adventures that I've been through. Um, it leaves me just to thank you all again for being here tonight, um, when you could be doing so much else on a bank holiday Saturday. Um, I want to wish everyone in Malaysia the very best of futures with your newfound, regained freedoms and to stay well done to all of you for standing up for yourselves and then standing together peacefully as a country to abide by the decisions of the majority and support the rule of law. You deserve great things.